thanks for tuning in today. I am Nicole Forbes, and uh, I'm with Dennis the Seventies, and today we are talking about beneficial insects and pollinators. It is a big topic, and um, in order to really cover as much as I want, uh, there is a lot of information broken into two separate blog articles that are attached to this video as the, in, the in the description. One focuses more on pollinators, specifically mason bees and leaf, uh, summer leafcutter bees, and the other handout or blog covers more uh, specifically on beneficial insects as a whole. I would like to start by talking about beneficial insects because pollinators belong inside that category. So then we'll get into pollinators. So to break down the, con the concept of beneficial insects, the first thing uh, that I like to put out there as education to the public is, as humans, I suppose we're just, we're predisposed to be um, kind of afraid of bugs. Uh, you know, don't bug me, right? You know, all of the, the it's built into our culture, it's built into our uh, awareness that bugs are um, not welcome around us. But in reality, bugs and insects not only, you know, live on us and with us, um, but are critical to uh, the various natural cycles as well as to our uh, health and well-being, to our food supply, um, and even as food supply then to uh, larger animals such as birds, etc. When we <clears throat> walk out into the outdoors and see insects flying around, a great thing to remember is that according to studies and research done, approximately 90% of the insects found in the average home garden are beneficial or benign insects, which leaves 10% or less to be actual pest insects to you or your plants. So that's a big table tipped towards the friendly bugs uh, that are out there versus the um, aggressors or the ones that you want to control or um, reduce population. <coughs> when we talk about beneficial insects, what kind of benefits do they give us? What are the three basic types of beneficial insects? The three are pollinators, as I mentioned, so they are the ones that are pollinating our flowers to produce fruit, and seed and more flowers. <clears throat> there are predators, and we understand the concept of predators. These are bugs that eat other bugs. <clears throat> and then the third type of beneficial insect is called a parasit parasitoid. And parasitoids are parasitic insects, so they use the body of another bug to host a certain uh, aspect of their life cycle, and then usually uh, have an egg or a larva that lives inside of the insect to hatch out of it. We know ladybugs as probably one of the most common predator beneficial insects, and ladybugs not only are you know friendly and cute and celebrated you know since we were children singing songs about them. But ladybugs are an available insect in the sense that they can be kept in a hibernated state in a refrigerator or cold storage and then brought to a warmer temperature to emerge from their hibernation. They come out of hibernation hungry and so again they begin uh, their predation of the food sources of insects that are in their area. And food sources for ladybugs include aphids, which are probably one of the most common insects in, in our gardens, <clears throat> but also spider mites, lace bugs, uh, mealybug larvae, and a lot of larvae of uh, our pest insects. So ladybugs do a great job of uh, preying on the pest insects that we have. And ladybugs have a life cycle of their own. 
that includes an egg and a larva before it develops into a full-scale adult ladybug. And the ladybug larva looks completely different than the adult ladybug. So not only is it important to understand when we're using beneficials, and especially when we're releasing something like a ladybug, we want to be able to recognize all of the different aspects of its life cycle as that beneficial insect so we can protect it. A juvenile or larval stage of ladybug actually eats more than the adult form as well. So think of like a, a growing teenager getting a lot more uh, nutrition so that they can actively grow. That young ladybug or larval ladybug actually does even more benefit to us. But it's not a hibernating type stage of its life cycle. So we use the adults to move them into the garden, provide them with ample food supply and a nice habitat, and then those adults will make baby ladybugs that become then the you know powerhouses of the control um, aspect. So understanding the life cycle, how the predator or parasitoid or pollinator benefits us and then again how we can benefit them so that we continue a population that can live and thrive in our garden for season after season to give us that, um, that benefit that we're looking for. In addition to ladybugs, other beneficial insects that are able to, uh, more predators than anything that we're able to usually buy or order in for our gardens, praying mantis, which are kind of indiscriminate hunters of anything that they can fit in their mouths. Um, praying mantis will eat good bugs and bad bugs. Um, the lace wings are another beneficial insect that are often available either in combination with ladybugs or as eggs sold separately. Lace wings are also fabulous predators of the lace bug that bothers our rhododendrons and azaleas and um, a lot of other pest um, aphids as well, but a lot of other pests in our garden. So between lace wings and ladybugs, those are two very easy to acquire, easy to keep, and non-aggressive, um, pretty little bugs to you know, share your garden with. When we get into the parasitoids, um, they're often in the wasp family. Uh, there are other members of the parasitoids that are not wasps, but a large number of them are wasps. Now when I say wasps, most people are like, no thank you. Um, and I understand that we have a complicated relationship with wasps and other stinging insects, but the parasitoid wasps that are involved with controlling our garden insects and garden pests tend to be very, very small wasps. Not the size of a honeybee or a yellow jacket or a paper wasp, more like between an eighth of an inch in size and a sixteenth of an inch in size. These are not wasps that you're going to swat away or find at your uh, patio table while you're having a picnic or anything. These are really out there doing work for us and we're not very aware of them. The parasitoid wasp, there's one called an aphidist wasp that hunts aphids specifically. So it's the equal size of an aphid, which are very small. The parasitoid wasp for aphids flies around a plant that has an aphid colony and stings an individual aphid and at the same time dis, uh, deposits an egg inside them, kind of a paralyzed aphid that's just been stung. The wasp egg then develops inside that paralyzed aphid. It consumes it as the wasp grows and eventually a fully mature wasp exits the exoskeleton of the aphid to fly out and hunt more aphids. The aphid itself has been nutrition and habitat for the developing wasp to keep it fully protected inside the aphid body. Now, often the insects in our garden, as well as the plants, are talking to one another and communicating throughout uh, different species in an, in an environment using chemical signals. 
things that we're not tuned into, of course, are being communicated throughout the insect world as well as the plant world. When we consider that there are a lot of insects that are after aphids, for example, these bugs need to be able to talk to each other. And so when an aphidus wasp flies to a plant that has aphids on it, if ladybugs have also come to visit that plant, ladybugs have walked all around that plant, maybe started eating some of the aphids, the wasp would be vulnerable to being consumed by a ladybug once it has put its egg inside of an aphid body. So the wasp and the ladybug need to know that each other are present. And the way that they do that is ladybugs leave a chemical trail everywhere they walk on the plant. I, I just like to say ladybugs have stinky feet. And everywhere that they step around on the plant, they've left a signal to the aphidus wasp that this is a ladybug dominated plant and maybe they could go find another one. So it is, again, the communication system that's going on in our garden that is also something that we need to be aware of and preserve so that all of these insects can interact well with one another. Now, beneficial insects, pollinators, predators, and parasitoids are already in your garden. They are already there. So attracting them by providing habitat and food supply is only going to increase the population as well as protect those that are already present, potentially even attracting additional insects that are beneficial as you've given that great environment for them to live in. It is more important that we, I mean, we can, we'll talk about plants to lure them and attract them, but there are some gardening practices and some product choices that are also critical in determining whether or not uh, we are gardening kind of with those beneficial insects or being counterproductive to working with insects by putting out a lot of sprays and chemicals. First off, of course, we want to use um, the least toxic controls as we possibly can and realize that even non-toxic controls, such as neem oil, insecticidal soap, these will affect beneficial insects just as much as they affect our pests and, and uh, bad insects. So we want to, again, be very careful once we've inserted ourselves in with a pesticide spray, we've really lost the control that the beneficials can help us with, and now we're in charge of that um, control ourselves. In addition, chemicals can confuse that conversation, that um, our chemical spray usage can confuse the natural chemical signals that are being used by the insects to communicate to one another, creating a lot of static, essentially, in their communication world lessening the efficiency that they can all do working uh, amongst one another. Thirdly, how we cut back and clean up our gardens in the fall and through the winter months can make a giant impact on the spring insect population that emerges from hibernation after winter has passed. In the fall, just as our flowers drop seeds and our plants start to go dormant, the insects also are preparing for winter by looking for shelter, by seeking places to go dormant, to lay eggs, or to overwinter in the garden. Many of the places that our insects seek to use as habitat in our garden include leaf litter, so um, as plants drop their leaves onto the ground below shrubs and uh, trees, the leaf litter that builds up provides a great habitat for a lot of our beneficial insects. And beyond that, hollow stems of perennials and shrubs and even just uh, Cracks and crevices in twigs and things will allow these insects places to winter over. In leaf litter, which
which is often raked or blown by a landscaper and bagged up and shipped off to the yard debris collection, in that leaf litter, we would normally find ladybug uh, colonies overwintering, butterfly eggs or caterpillar larvae waiting to become butterflies. There are native ground nesting bumblebees that are often living just below that leaf litter pile in the soil layer, in addition to countless arthropods and other insects that are either responsible for predating or parasitizing or even just decomposing. And in addition, things like ground beetles, which work as decomposers, predators, and pollinators, are one of those additional insects that thrive in a thick, healthy layer of leaf litter. Now again, many of our garden practices include this winter cleanup where we've raked and removed all of that leaf litter. We have pruned down all of the twigs and sticks in our perennial gardens, and we have really eradicated any potential spots for these bugs to winter over meaning that come spring, we, if we bought ladybugs last year, we'll need to buy them again, for example, or the beneficials that we had in the previous year have basically been evicted over the winter, and we need to then build that population back up. One of the most um, easy to use structures in your garden for a lot of our beneficial insects are the dead hollow stems of last year's perennials. And I'll show you these uh, beautiful hollow stems right now. This is from Asclepius or butterfly weed. And of course, lots of us are growing Asclepius knowing that we need to build up both the nectar and food source for our monarch butterflies. So Asclepius is a very specific plant that is uh, utilized by monarch caterpillars. But the Asclepius stems, after the plant has gone dormant for the winter, are totally hollow. And so I've taken a few and I've split them in half to see the insides of them. But just to show you these wonderful, you know, various size, nice, sturdy, almost wood tubes that are completely hollow from top to bottom. And when we open them up, often we see either debris. So inside the tube, I can see poop, bug poop, you know, so debris of the insects that have been spending the winter in there. And I might even have a Oh, and here's a little cocoon, just a little fuzzy cocoon from an insect that it was spending some time in there, wrapped up in a little silky sheet and had already emerged for the spring. So in these various stems that I've split, some had insects in them and most, if not all of them, had signs that there was an insect inside them at one time, which tells me that this habitat is critical in my garden. And had I cut my Asclepius stems all the way down to the ground in the fall, I wouldn't have that nesting opportunity or that place for insects to spend the winter. So again, giving them a place to be is going to increase the odds that they're there when you need them. There are a lot of um, really neat insect hotels or uh, this is like a beneficial bug house. This has space for solitary bees, ladybugs, butterflies, earwigs, and lace wings. By having different diameter stems and holes and little holes drilled into wood blocks, the different diameters will allow different bugs to kind of um, settle into those different nesting chambers. The disadvantage of something such as this is that not only does this stay 
out uh, and vulnerable, of course, a woodpecker could come along now and just have a quick, easy meal by reaching into all of these holes and eating the bugs that we've been trying to protect in here. This also does not, all of these pieces are glued in. So there's like bamboo poles and wood blocks, and they're all glued in here, which means that I can't remove any of these to clean them or maintain them. So it's really just giving them extra like wild habitat, but not quite as good as stepping in and taking care of the pollinators, which we can do for mason bees and the leaf cutter bees. <clears throat> when, we, when we garden for beneficial insects, we will notice an increase in bird population because, of course, birds are eating bugs. We also will notice a bigger cycle that's occurring beyond our own, you know, sense of control in the garden. So we will start seeing insects and understanding how their patterns interact and recognizing, of course, the good bugs versus the bad bugs. Uh, at the end of the beneficial bugs handout, there is a resource guide, and one of my favorite resources is actually called just that, Good Bug, Bad Bug. It's a photograph style kind of flip book that's uh, written by Jessica Walliser and is great at showing the different life cycles of these beneficial insects. Also talks about pests and, and what, how to create habitat, what they eat, and how to you know, keep them happy. Um, so specific from one beneficial insect to another, really kind of the, the dialed in details of all of them. But in general, Beneficial insects like diversity, so a, a wide range of plants available in your garden are going to benefit a wide range of beneficial insects. They also prefer simple flowers, uh, and simple flowers are often found in weeds and weed seeds or weed flowers. And vegetable and herb flowers are also highly beneficial and attractive to our beneficial insects. And one of the most common flowers blooming right now in most people's lawns is the dandelion. And the dandelion is one of the earliest blooming, most uh, commonly found in landscape food supplies for the very early pollinators that wake up this time of year and have not a lot else to, uh, to choose from. So going into talking about pollinators, <clears throat> we really talk probably more than anything about mason bees this time of year. But when we really start thinking about pollinators in general, we've got our native bees. We have the European honeybee, which is an imported and introduced bee. And then we have assorted additional pollinators, which include hummingbirds, dragonflies, beetles, moths, butterflies, flies, and even a mosquito can act as a pollinator. Bats, they're in there too, so um, I can pollinate with my little finger. I can pollinate another plant with the same thing. Moving pollen from flower to flower is the act of pollination. And so any animal or insect that frequents flowers has the ability to do so and to move pollen. There are advantages to pollinators, and some are more efficient in pollinating than others. A lot of it is just accidental in the first place. So the bee is not specifically pollinating to pollinate. They are actually after nectar and pollen inside the flower. The flower is tricking them into passing by an apparatus that holds their reproductive organ to dust them with pollen while they're on their way to get something else usually. So pollinators get coated with pollen just like um, like dirt falling on them. And then when they want to stay clean, they have to then take all of the pollen that's gotten on them as they visit a flower and store it somewhere. 
So bees typically have different storage uh, apparatus that include either little pouches on either sides of their abdomens, little saddle bags on the back of their backs, and some bees have little leg pouches where they collect their pollen there. And the different pollen collection or transportation apparatuses that they have increase their ability to pollinate by the amount of pollen that they can carry. In addition to that, the size of the bee, the furriness of the bee, or how much hair it has, and its ability to be out in cold or inclement weather versus needing warmth to fly gives those bees different advantages. So the European honeybee, most of us know, is a little bit of a fair weather bee. <clears throat> doesn't want to fly when it's below 60 or too cold. Doesn't like to go out on a rainy day. But our blue orchard mason bee, which is the long name for what we lovingly just called the mason bee. Our mason bee is able to go out in cold weather, is able to fly in rainy conditions, and is a slightly smaller bee than the European honeybee and much fuzzier. So this little guy works harder in more of the conditions, weather conditions we have in springtime, and at the same time is more efficient in collecting and gathering pollen, and its size allows it to go further into flowers or access a wider range of flowers and effectively pollinate them. Now the blue orchard mason bee is amongst a group of bees that are solitary. That means that they do not live in hives, they do not produce honey, they don't have queens and that whole bee society, they are individual solitary, uh, they live in communities, but they are still in their own uh, separate habitat. The difference in how these bees live in the fact that they don't have a colony or a hive means that they are also non-aggressive. They are easy then for us to take care of and they can sting but they are reluctant to do so and if they do sting the sting does not contain a venom which does not cause anaphylactic shock response in anyone who has a, a issue with bees or has allergies. So we don't have to worry about, well you're not going to harvest honey, but you also aren't going to get stung, um, so you don't need to carry your EpiPen and all of those kinds of things. So the solitary bees, typically we have uh, the ability to kind of cultivate and care for either a spring bee, the blue orchard mason bee, or a summer bee known as the summer leaf cutter bee. So I want to talk a little bit about those because um, the spring bee, the mason bee, is out there to pollinate all our fruit trees, so cherries and apples and pears and plums. The fruit trees are uh, blooming right at the time that the orchard mason bee wants to be out and emerge. They are also able to pollinate blueberries and early strawberries and early season berry crops. Whereas the summer leaf cutter bee is out in July and August, for example, and is the bee that would be pollinating our squash blossoms, our watermelon, out uh, on the sunflowers, for example, in addition to the other competitor bees that, that are out there that time of year. The Blue Orchard Mason Bee is so uh, highly regarded because, as I mentioned, spring conditions can be wet and cold, which are not favored by our really most other relied on pollinator, which is the European honeybee. Often I hear, well, I listen to farm reports, um, you know, don't you? Um, so, you know, on the farm reports, they 
talk about the weather in California affecting the almond orchards and that the almond farmers in California have to hold their bees if it's too cold or if it rains this weekend and the almonds are in bloom. Because big orchard outfits often are bringing hives of European honeybees that are like migrant worker hives. They bring large groups of hives to the orchard when the orchard is in bloom to temporarily work to pollinate the orchard. And once the orchard is out of bloom, that beehive moves on to another crop or another piece of property. So not only, of course, do we have kind of an imbalanced reliance on this European honeybee supply, but they're fickle in their ability to go out and do their job. Now, the Blue Orchard Mason Bee, several advantages that we have with keeping the Blue Orchard Mason Bee beyond what I mentioned, non-aggressive and, um, you know, super efficient. Probably the most direct advantage is how close they stay to home. So if this, for example, is a bee house, this is a very fancy, this is a bee chalet, actually. So uh, you don't have to have a fancy bee house like this. I have um, coffee cans with my bee straws stuck in them. So this is a high-end bee house. But if this were my bee house, <clears throat> I would be, uh, I would be uh, adding cocoons, adding tubes to my little holes here to let the bees emerge as the temperature rises to the right range, and that's between 53 and 55 degrees for about a week's time. So we've had some peaks into the low 50s uh, already this spring, but probably not a week of it, which means as we dip back into the low 40s for the next couple of days, we probably don't have bees already emerged and awake. But as we get to that more consistent temperatures in the low 50s, the little mason bees uh, will emerge from their cocoons. They wake up and they begin foraging. They forage within 300 feet of their home nest site. So in most cases, that is your property and maybe your immediate neighbors. Not, they're not going miles away to forage uh, from a uh, reliable food supply and then come back to you. So that means that you need to have things in bloom to support that bee population when they're out. So if you have lots of fruit trees and blueberries, that's great. The kind of average bee to tree ratio is about 10 cocoons per mature fruit tree. So if we were really trying to up our pollination game and we wanted to purchase mason bees, for example, this is a box of bees. Uh, they're cocoons right now, and there's 10 of them. And the 10, so a box of 10 bees would do one mature fruit tree. And here they kind of look like um, chocolate-covered raisins. Don't eat them. Inside each one of these little fuzzy uh, packages is a fully mature adult bee in hibernation. And you see that there are different sizes. We have male bees and female bees. And the female bees are always larger than the male. Our little box tells us that there are 10 cocoons in here, four females and six males. And then I, I have a little release instructions, which says refrigerate cocoons in this box until day temperatures are 53 degrees and above and blooms are open. Then open the box lid, place cocoons on top of nesting holes, keep cocoons out of direct sunlight. So that means I'll put them back in this box. I just took them out of the refrigerator. I would take my chalet my little box of bees, open it up nicely so they don't get lost in the flaps. And I can put it right here, out of the sun, out of the rain, kind of up in the attic, 
And of course, as they wake up and emerge, they're going to fly out, they'll do their job, and eventually they will find their way back to this spot. And then they will use the holes in this nesting block, which we actually ideally fill with a different insert. So the way I was saying here that we can't remove these from the insect house, we do like to use inserts that can be separately removed from the bee block itself or from the bee house. So this is just a bunch of, of uh, holes in here. I can insert the tube into the hole. <clears throat> and now a bee is going to be able to lay its eggs in here. And eventually, at the end of the bee season, I can take this tube, which has bees in it, and now protect the hibernating cocoons of the bees so that by next spring they are healthy and I can release them again according to the weather. So you'll see again in your kind of class handout, there's all of these steps and stages to the life cycle of the bees, including like I mentioned, when they begin to fly and when they break dormancy, but also when they lay their eggs and when their life cycle is essentially wrapped up for the season. So <clears throat> the 53, 55 degree weather is typically late February, early March. The female bee lives for approximately six weeks and then perishes after having laid eggs for the future generation. Each tube, each bee, can lay six to eight eggs inside one of these little chambers. So if you start with 10 bees today, you could have 30 plus bees at the end of uh, next spring, for example, when they emerge. But it is important that we take care of them. If we left them in here, if we left them in my little coffee can, uh, woodpeckers, mites, other insects, all kinds of things could happen to them that make the bees already vulnerable in the world, and that's why we know pollinators are having a hard time. So inserting yourself into caring for them, removing the tubes, storing them in a protected container, and even over winter in this, they go into a refrigerator to be given the cool conditions of winter, but in a safe and protected environment that allows us in spring to remove portions of the cocoons and release our bees in thirds, for example, which would allow us to stretch our pollination time out beyond that six weeks of a natural uh, mason bee life cycle. I like to release a third of my bees every two weeks so that I've stretched my pollination time beyond that six week period, but I'm not, uh, by May, I should have all my bees out because by June, early June, they're done. Um, and the cocoons are packed in there, and then of course we can pull the uh, tubes out, store them in a protected space. They need to be outside for a while, so we store them in a little nylon bag in a garden shed or in a garage where they're getting ambient temperature. By fall, we will take those little cocoons. This is a like a paper straw, so the straw peels back we were able to remove the cocoons. You saw how they look in there, and then we make sure that those cocoons are clean and healthy. You can use a toothbrush or a paintbrush to um, you know, brush off any kind of dust or pollen or mites that might be on there, and then put them into their little protective enclosure and keep them in the refrigerator over winter. The leaf cutter bee is the summer is our summer bee. So where the mason bee is like that early spring, late winter, early spring bee for the first things to bloom, we can't expect that same bee to, to pollinate our summer vegetable garden. So our squash and our watermelon, 
our beans and sunflowers, those are all the summer leaf cutter bees uh, timeline and realm as opposed to the mason bee. So if you think through the crops that you grow or the challenges perhaps that you have, you know, maybe your summer garden does great, but your spring berry crop and fruit crop is less productive than you'd like, that may help you to kind of determine which bee is the right bee for you. And because both the summer and mason bee, summer leaf cutter and mason bee stay so local to your yard, it's important that we have enough food supply for them at their time of critical feeding. So I did bring out a few more plants that I love to suggest for mason bees that are in bloom or about to be in bloom this time of year because many of us have a few fruit trees, a couple of blueberries, for example, <clears throat> and so benefiting, uh, benefiting from mason bees is definitely a potential for your garden, but you may not, with a few blueberries and a few fruit trees, have enough forage to support a large colony of, of bees, well, not colony, but large population of uh, mason bees. Some very common landscape plants in addition to the blueberries and the fruit trees that are in bloom this time of year that are very popular and beneficial to the mason bees I have brought up onto the table here and that includes a group of natives or mostly native plants this guy doesn't belong there. Natives are mostly native plants, and that's our Oregon grape. Here is evergreen huckleberry, Vaccinium olatum, and the King Edward VII red flowering currant, Ribe sanguinium. All three of these are either just beginning to flower, so our Oregon grape has just begun to bloom. I have flower buds already visible on the evergreen huckleberry and actually a few flowers open. Not yet in bloom is the red flowering currant, but this will be blooming very, very soon. <clears throat> Typically, the, these three would be a perfect kind of a uh, group of plants that would like to grow in a similar environment as well. So you could have this in one little area as sort of your bee forage uh, part of the landscape. This is Pieris japonica, which is also a very common landscape plant grown at this time of year. Evergreen, early flowering, uh, thrives in similar conditions as rhododendrons and azaleas, and the flowers are lightly fragrant, and they are a little kind of closed, almost like a closed bell shape to them, which makes this uh, one of the favorite kind of shapes of flowers for small native bees to pollinate. They just crawl right up inside the flower, kind of just do a little loop-de-loop -loop and back out, and they've got what they want, flower got what it wanted, everybody wins. Pieris, again, can provide Although it's not a fruiting plant, it's not an uh, orchard plant, pears can provide an additional food supply for those early season pollinators like mason bees. Heathers also have that same <clears throat> bell-shaped flower. So we have pink heather, white heather, these are both springwood, actually this, yeah, springwood pink and springwood white. And the shape of a heather flower is the same, I don't even know if a close-up makes any difference, shape of a heather flower is also like oh, a tiny, a tiny little bell. And of course, the brown pieces hanging out <clears throat> are the reproductive parts of the flower. So the bees got to pass those reproductive parts to get all the way up into the back part of the flower to get some nectar and then back out. And even by touching it, I've gotten pollen on my hands. So you can see how easy it is to be a bee and to do your job when you've got all of the right materials out here to do it. 
I brought a blueberry because, of course, they will be blooming soon. <clears throat> and we all know that blueberry flowers, when pollinated, <clears throat> make blueberries. <clears throat> so why wouldn't you want more blueberries? Big swollen buds at the tips of most of our blueberry uh, stems right now will be in bloom soon. And again, that's um, where we want those bees to be out to pollinate them. And then the last one <clears throat> that I brought is an ornamental. This is Sweetbox, also referred to as Sarcococca russifolia. Sar <clears throat> Sarcococca is an evergreen, uh, shade-loving landscape plant. We'll take morning sun as well. But again, in bloom this time of year with this very simple flower. Um, pollinators don't like fancy, complicated, highly double, lots of petal flowers. That's a very complicated thing for them to get through to get to the reproductive organs of the plant. So the simpler the flower, the more out there the uh, sepals and pistils are, <clears throat> pistils and stamens are, the easier it is for the bee to access and get its job done. Sarcococca also happens to be deliciously fragrant. Um, so just sitting here holding it, I'm like swooning with the wonderful smell that it's making. So Sarcococca is a great one for you and me and also for the bees. Drought tolerant, deer resistant, evergreen, shade loving, three to five feet tall and wide. The options out there to provide food supply, attractant for pollinators and beneficial insects are vast. If you come to our garden centers, you will find usually that we have our perennial section uh, highlighted for flowers that are attractive to bees and pollinators, or we have a section for hummingbirds, for example. We tend to, does the 70s tends to recommend and stop primarily organic fertilizers, natural controls, and beneficial insects. The idea for the best success for you would be to have a diverse garden, so lots of different plants, to be a little bit messier when it comes to fall and winter, to take a break from the mowing and the blowing and the raking and all of the cleanup because that is habitat for all of our beneficials that we've worked so hard to learn about and attract. If your homeowners association or neighbors object, order a sign that has a pretty little ladybug on it that says beneficial insect habitat. And maybe that won't stop them from complaining, but at least it'll make everybody realize that you're not lazy or um, homebound or whatever, but that you are doing something with intent and that this garden is actually serving the community in a bigger picture. Um, I think we all need to learn how to recognize that. With that being said, um, Portland Plant List is another great resource for coming up with native plant selections for plant communities that grow well together. But I simply recommend, you know, if you don't want to do any research, just walk into the garden center, ask us for some of our favorite pollinator plants or beneficial insect attracting plants. Everybody's got their best selections or their favorites. We'd be happy to steer you in the right direction. I hope that this has been an educational and enlightening topic for you all and that you uh, go out there and look at the bugs in your world just a little bit differently. As always, I appreciate you watching and happy gardening.